صدق الله العلي العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المظلمين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وما صلى على وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity that He provides for us opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance and in reflection of Him Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Next we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhima afzalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. We we'll begin many of his sermons by saying, Usikum wa nafsi bi I advise you and I advise myself to be God conscious, God fearing, and pious human beings. We began last week with a discussion or the short explanation of the dua that we recite after our salah, and that is the dua of Ya Aliyu, Ya Azim. We went into the introduction yes, last week and the first two verses which is Ya Aliyu, Ya Azim, Ya Ghafuru, Ya Rahim. We come to the next sentence now in which says Anta Rabbul Azim. This statement Anta Rabbul Azim is a statement that has many different understandings or depths of understanding. As we've noticed with the dua itself, the fact that just the first two lines, Ya Aliyu, Ya Azim, Ya Ghafuru, Ya Rahim, took us 20 minutes to understand. It shows us the depth of this dua and it requires reflection. And I think it, it points to the fact that, you know, sometimes the way that we recite dua uh, may not be most apt for fully understanding that dua. We sometimes recite dua with the goal of finishing the dua rather than understanding the dua. Right? Because we're in a race against time, we're in a race to recite as many du'as as we can. So we try not to ponder and reflect. But when you look at the depth of these du'as, it requires reflection, it requires pondering. Which is why many ulama say it is not necessary to even finish the entire du'a. Read a portion of the du'a with understanding and that has more significance than reciting the whole du'a with no understanding. So the phrase Anta Rabbul Azim, that you are the tremendous Lord or you are the great Lord, has many different dimensions of understanding. The first way of understanding that phrase is that 
It is a form of praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because previously we gave him the attributes or we called him by the attributes Ali and Azim. These two attributes, as we mentioned, separate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his creation. Yeah? That he is above us, that he is far greater than us, that he is unreachable or untouchable. It's hard to imagine who he is because he is Ali and Azim. But at the same time, in his uluwiya, yeah, in his greatness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor and rahim. And we saying this, we conceptualize this, that Ya Allah, I know many people, I know many kings who have power, I know many kings who have authority, but that authority does not allow them to become merciful, O oh Allah. Yeah? That mercy, that authority does not allow them to become great. Forget kings, you can take <coughs> a manager at a work. Yeah? You can take uh, the, the head of the household. When that power or the, the understanding or the feeling that I am the boss comes in. Yeah? And you begin to oppress those who are below you. Yeah? These are examples of the same thing where we say, Look at me, when I'm given a little bit of power, Ya Allah, I can't handle it. But you, O oh Rabb, who have the most power, who are the greatest, who is the most high, Yet you are Ali Yun yeah? And Ya Allah, because of that, it makes me happy and I say in praise and in celebration, Anta Rabbul Azim, Ya Allah. Yeah? Thank God you are my Rabb, is what we are saying with this line. Yeah? Thank God you are not like me, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is what we are saying in this line. So the first understanding of Antar Rabbul Azim is actually a celebration and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the characteristics and the attributes that are being possessed by Him. That's the first understanding. A second understanding that we get about this phrase, Antar Rabbul Azim, that it is a Statement of confession. It is a testimony. Ashhadu bi annaka Rabbul Azim. Yeah? That I am bearing witness that you are the Rabb who is great. Yeah? It is a testimony. It is a confession. Now, in its own, it's not impressive. Yeah? We all believe. We all believe He is Rabbul Azim. Yeah, and I'm confessing. I confess every day. Why is it different in this particular verse or in this particular sense? Here I'm confessing to the rububiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? It is a testimony to the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the managerial powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And the reason why this is important is for two reasons. One is that whenever anyone has ever done shirk on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has been shirk in rububiya, not in uluhiya. Yeah? It has been shirk in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when I say anta rabbul azim, what I am testifying to is that, Ya Allah, I bear witness that you are the Lord and I am not doing shirk on you. I am not relying on anybody else but you. So it's that first understanding of that, that I am not doing shirk the way others have done shirk, and I recognize and I testify that anta rabbul azim. Yeah? The second understanding is, or the second point that we have to remember, is that there are people and, and, and Muslims who believe in the concept of tafweed. Yes? And what tafweed says is that the created or the creation are not in need of the creator for their continuation. Yes? So there are those who believe that we needed God to create us. He created us. But after that, God himself has taken a step back. Yeah? He says, now I'm going to let it run. Yeah? The way sometimes managers run, isn't it? Yeah? Managers don't like to interfere. So there are two types of managerial approaches, isn't it? Right? There's micromanagers and then those who just leave it. Right? Here, there are those who believe that God is of this type, where He just leaves it yeah, and He lets everybody run. What we are saying is that, Ya Allah, it's not possible for you to leave it. Why? Because I recognize that I am needy, Ya Allah. Yeah? I recognize that I need you. And how is it one that needs you that you wouldn't come to them when they need you, O oh Allah? Yeah? And therefore this testimony, yeah? this confession to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that 
I testify my Rabb that I am needy and that I need you for every moment of my life. My brothers and sisters, you know, if we understand this, right? What this means is that this particular short line, Anta Rabbul Azim, is a testimony, is a confession, but it is a confession that is based on knowledge. It is not a confession that is based on emotion or conjecture. Yeah? Yeah, and it is not something that I am just saying because everyone else is saying it. It is not simply because I am saying it because it's the right thing to say. No, when I say Anta Rabbul Azim, it is a confession. It should be a confession and a testimony that is emanating from a place where it is coming from knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Of ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of yaqeen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my brothers and sisters, if it comes from that place where it is emanating, it is sprouting from a place where I recognize that He is Rabb, yeah? I recognize His greatness, if it actually purely emanates from that, the phrase Anta Rabbul Azim, not only does it testify to the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it testifies to my ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? It is a reflective statement. It is marvelous. Yeah? It is marvelous that one small phrase like anta rabbul azim yeah, can cover two whole concepts at the same time. And one who can testify to this type of statement Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in surah number 41 verse number 30 إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَحْسَنْتُ مَلَائِكَةِ He says indeed those who say our Lord is Allah رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ yeah, This is what we are saying isn't it? أَنْتَ الرَّبُّ الْعَظِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who testify that I am the Lord, yeah, that I, that Rabbuna, that my Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they were steadfast. What does that steadfast mean? It means they recognized their position as a servant and they worshipped God accordingly. That's what we said it means, doesn't it? Yeah? You guys are looking at me like you're fasting today. Yeah? Yeah? Are you all with me? Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sometimes the fasting brain just works a little bit slower than the regular brain. Yeah? But inshallah, you guys are understanding me. Yes? Yes? Okay, good. Yes? So Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, Those who can testify and know and say, Our Lord is Allah, and then they remain steadfast. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَ Malaika begin to come down on these people. And they say to them, لَا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ yeah? This is the reward for those who can recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their Rabb. Imagine the thought process, right? When we recite this dua, that if we can manage to think about even part of this, how much more beautiful our dua would be. And inshallah, when we do think like this, Allah will accept every single thing that we do and accept the dua from us and answer it inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين 
اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام صلي على محمد وعلى محمد وصلي على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين صلي على محمد وعلى وصلي على سبتي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد الشباب أهل الجنة اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب دعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد As we said last week, inshallah, in these second sermons, we'll try to discuss um, certain points of the month of Ramadan that we can reflect upon to increase the spirituality and effectiveness of this great month, inshallah. And you know, in, in that process of reflection itself, there is great benefit. And I'm sure that if you, if, that you have spent time in reflection um, and you have spent time in contemplation, though finding that time is difficult um, in a general sense. You know, I've been fortunate in an unfortunate way that, you know, I have to drive to Bathurst every day for lectures. Um, and people always ask me, how is that? You know, I say, with every bala, there is rahma as well, you know. Um, the drive allows me 40 minutes of quiet and peace um, each way where I can spend time reflecting. Um, and upon that reflection, you know, it's really important that we try to find some of that time. But what, what came to me in this reflection is that, you know, whatever the holy month of Ramadan dictates to us, whatever the holy month of Ramadan recommends for us, or whatever the holy month of Ramadan forces us to do, it is actually an indication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what He wants us to do the remainder of the year. Yeah? Shall I say that again? Yes? Whatever we have... <laughs> I, I understand, trust me. Yeah? And I have to speak. Yeah, imagine, subhanAllah, right? Um, whatever... Yeah, whatever we have to do, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do in the month of Ramadan, either by making it wajib or making it mustahab, yeah, when we focus on those things and reflect about them, it is actually a way to train us because that's what He wants us to do the rest of the year. Okay, so let's take an example. For example, eating less, right? In the month of Ramadan, generally, we eat less. Yes, we have a nice iftar, right? But for 18, 19 hours, right? Um, we don't eat, we feel the hunger. We look our best at about 7 p.m. when the stomach has tucked in a bit, yes? Um, but these are points when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to show us that, look, hey, you can survive with eating less. Yeah? You can survive by not eating as much. And therefore, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is, is making us think about that or become used to, to that. Another example would be reading the Qur'an more, right? We read Qur'an more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that I want you to read Qur'an all the time like this, not just in the month of Ramadan. We recite a lot more du'as. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us, call me more often, yeah? Talk to me more often, yeah? Supplicate to me more often. Likewise, we sleep less in this month. Right? And that's something else that he is trying to tell us. Where I want to focus our attention is on the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month teaches us to be civil and social Muslims. 
Yes? And what I mean by that is that he teaches us and, and, and recommends to us to be Muslims who care about society and not to be Muslims who only care about themselves right? or individuals who only care about individuals. In this month we've been given traditions that one who break, helps break someone else's fast who is hungry even with a date is promised Jannah. Yeah? And even with a glass of water is promised Jannah. In this month, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family says, make sure that the Aitam are okay. Make sure you are nice to the elders. Make sure you look after your family. This is a month in which we are being taught how to care for humanity as a whole. Right? And this is, I think, something that we really need to take forward the remaining of the year. Inshallah, this is what my Eid sermon will be about as well. The importance of being social and um, civil and concerned about welfare. The welfare of society, not just Muslims, but society. You know, it is the care for other human beings which separate believers from one another. Right? It is how they look after other human beings that in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, metaphorically speaking, they rise in rank. It is not by the salah that one does. Yeah? It is not by the fasting that one does. It is not by how much Quran one recites. No, it's about how one takes care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Yeah? That's what makes them special in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And there are many ways that we can do that. And you need to reflect about how you can do it as an individual. Right? You can donate online to, to many, many organizations which $50 will feed an entire family the whole month of Ramadan. 50 bucks is nothing, alhamdulillah, for most of us, it's nothing. Right? Especially in this month of Ramadan when our expenses are less to begin with. We have food every day provided. We should have less expenses, right? So we can go out and spend a little bit of money <coughs> to help the poor. And the reason why I, I even say this, right? I will end with this to, to really make us think about it. <coughs> in Surah Al-Balad, right? Surah Al-Balad, I believe, is the 90th surah of the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verses 11 through 16, He says, فَلَقْ تَحَمَلْ أَقَبَى yeah, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَلَقَبَ He says that yet they have not embarked upon the uphill journey. Yeah? The, the hard journey. He's talking about Muslims. Yeah? These are people who believe, these are people, some are, um, <coughs> some accept, some don't accept, whatever. But he says, yet most are not willing to take the tough road. Yeah? And what, ma- what makes you understand, what is this aqaba, this uphill journey that I'm talking about? And then he describes what the uphill journey is. You know what it is? He says that it is to free a slave. It is to feed the needy on a day of starvation. Yeah? Or an orphan, taking care of an orphan amongst your relatives. Or a needy man in desolation. While being one of those who have faith and who enjoin one another in patience and in compassion. He doesn't talk about the uphill journey is, is fasting 19 hour days. No, it's not the uphill journey. Yeah? The uphill journey is not reciting salah. The uphill journey is when we take care of other human beings. When we look after other human beings. That is when I have become selfless. Yeah? And the month of Ramadan teaches us to be selfless. And if we can continue this in the years to come, we're going to be that strong united ummah that is needed for our imam, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahi rahmanir rahim. Wal asr. Inna al insana lafi khusr. Illa al ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu al-Aliyyu al-Azim.